Our gospel this morning is taken from the book of Mark, chapter 6, verses 30 to 44. The apostles returned to Jesus and told him all that they had done and, had, and taught. And he said to them, Come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in the boat to a desolate place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them. And they ran there on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. And when it grew late, his disciples came to him and said, This is a desolate place, and the hour is now late. Send them away into the surrounding countryside and villages to buy themselves something to eat. But he answered them, You give them something to eat. And they said to him, Shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give it to them to eat? And he said to them, How many loaves do you have? Go and see. And when they had found out, they said, Five and two fish. Then he commanded them all to sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups by hundreds and fifties. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples to set before the people. And he divided the two fish among them all. And they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up 12 baskets full of broken pieces and of the fish. And those who ate the loaves were 5,000 men. This is the gospel of our Lord. You may be seated. <clears throat> Let us pray. Holy Father, we thank you for the gift of your son Jesus and for the lessons he teaches us. Open our ears and hearts so that we might receive and understand your word given to us this day. Let, us guide us, let it guide us and teach us so that we might put it into practice in our daily lives. To the glory of your holy name, amen. Over the last several weeks, we've been going through the gospel according to St. Mark. The earliest traditions of the church tell us that Mark walked with St. Peter the Apostle and wrote down Peter's recollections of his time with Jesus. Our Lutheran study Bible dates this gospel between 50 and 60 AD, which is 20 to 30 years after the resurrection. The section we're studying covers the beginning of Jesus' ministry of praying, preaching, teaching, and healing. He's gathered the apostles and taught them through parables, prayer, healing, and miracles what they are to do. Jesus was preparing the apostles to carry out his work because Jesus works through people. He works through people like you and I. We are called, as the apostles were called, to carry out his mission of praying, preaching, teaching, and healing. Today's reading begins with the return of the apostles after Jesus had sent them two by two to go and preach the word and heal the sick. But let's put that into context. If you recall, Jesus first calmed the storm. He took the apostles out in a boat, a storm blew up, and they were fearful for their lives. Most of them experienced sailors. This was to teach them that he had power over the natural world. He then exercised the Gerasene demoniac in the cemetery, sending the demons into a herd of pigs and thereby demonstrated his power over the supernatural world. Next, he healed the woman with the hemorrhage and raised Jairus' daughter from the dead, there demonstrating his power over sickness and death. And finally, Jesus took the disciples to Nazareth, where we are told, 
He could do no mighty work there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. His visit to Nazareth showed the disciples that the outcome of our prayer, preaching, teaching, and healing is beyond our power to control. The success of our efforts is not up to us, it's between the individual and God. The burden of success or failure is not ours to bear. And having taught them all these things, he then sent them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. Matthew, in his gospel, gives us some more details. And proclaim as you go, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse lepers, cast out demons. You received without paying, give without pay. Jesus works through his people, and just as Adam and Eve were given stewardship over the earth, so also we are given stewardship over the new kingdom that's entering through the work of Christ. But we can't force anyone to believe, just as Jesus will not force anyone to believe. We're called to pray for the lost, preach the good news, teach the ignorant, and heal the sick. God calls through the Holy Spirit, and some will listen. Others will not. Jesus told the disciples, as you enter the house, greet it. If the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. And if anyone will not receive you or listen to your words, shake the dust from your feet when you leave that house or town. Truly I say to you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah than for that town. If anyone will not receive you or listen to your words, shake the dust off your feet and leave. We cannot force people to change their minds, that's up to God. All we can do is plant the seed and to trust the Lord to make it sprout and grow. So Jesus taught the disciples that he's master of the natural world, master of the supernatural world, and master of life and health. Even so, there are self-imposed limits to his power over humanity. Some will believe, some will not. We are to do what we are sent to do, pray, preach, teach, and heal, and leave the rest to him. As his, as his mission progressed, Jesus' fame spread. His works were being talked about by the people who are trying to figure out who he is. Rumors have been flying. Last week we heard even King Herod heard of it, for Jesus' name had become known. Some said John the Baptist has been raised from the dead, and that's why these miraculous powers are at work in him. But others said he's Elijah, and others said he's a prophet like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. The people don't know what's going on, but they do know that wondrous things are happening. Today's reading begins when the apostles return from their mission. They're reporting the results. Rumors are still spreading. Crowds of people are coming and going. The apostles, just returned from Jesus' mission, don't even have time to eat. So Jesus takes them away in a boat to find a place where they can rest, but the crowds chase after them. They don't know who Jesus is, and they don't know what he's doing or why he's doing it, but the crowd is open, receptive to the word of God. The text tells us Jesus had compassion on them because they're sheep without a shepherd. Well, the good shepherd's here now, and he's going to teach them many things. The text doesn't tell us what he's taught, taught in this specific case. Perhaps some of what he told Nicodemus, or the Sermon on the Mount, or some other parables. We don't know, but he taught them for a long time and it was getting late. And he had another lesson to teach the disciples, a lesson in trust. When the disciples came to him saying, the hour's late, send these people away so they can get some food, he told them, you give them something to eat. He's going to teach them about the generosity of God's grace. 
First, the disciples balk at Jesus' command. Shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give it to them to eat? In the first place, they're out in the countryside in a desolate place where they aren't likely to find a bakery. And in the second place, they probably don't even have enough money to buy that much bread. No doubt they thought Jesus was being unreasonable. But as I say, Jesus has a lesson to teach. He asked the disciples, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. And after a while, they come back and say, five and two fish. I expect they thought Jesus, hearing this news, would say, okay, send them off to find food wherever they can. But he doesn't. Instead, he tells them all to sit down in groups of 50 or 100. And then he blesses the meager supply of food and starts handing it out to the people. And he keeps passing it out until they all ate and were satisfied with 12 baskets full of bread and fish left over. And those who ate, we're told, were 5,000 men. We've all heard stories about people who've trusted the Lord to provide their needs and received it in abundance. One we're all aware of, I hope, is Bethany Holmes, who began shortly after World War II, I believe, as an orphanage for children. And then they opened, they decided that they wouldn't do any active fundraising. They would trust the Lord to provide for them. And for roughly 50 years, they kept going without doing any organized fundraising. What they needed appeared. Another even more stunning case is that of George Muller, a 19th century German immigrant to England. Muller was born into a fairly, fairly well-off Prussian family, and his father wanted him to become a Lutheran minister. But he was a little bit of a wild kid and got into trouble, spent some time in jail, and ultimately, felt the call of God and changed his ways. He moved to England and became pastor of a church in Devonshire. There he married his wife and shortly after his marriage, his biographer writes, Muller began to have conscientious scruples about receiving a regular salary and also about the renting of pews in his church. They used to rent out the prime pews to people for the pastor to, to support the pastor. These two customs were discontinued by him. He and his wife told their needs to no one but the Lord. Occasionally reports were spread that they were starving, but though at times their faith was tried, their income was greater than before. They stopped taking a salary and ended up with more. He and his wife gave away freely all that they had above their present needs and trusted the Lord for their daily bread. The biographer continues, greatest of all Muller's undertakings was the erection and maintenance of the great orphanages at Bristol, which near the time of Mr. Muller's death were five immense buildings of solid granite capable of accommodating 2,000 orphans. In all the years since the orphans first arrived, the in all the years since the first orphans arrived, the Lord had sent food in due time, so that they never missed a meal for want of food. He began the undertaking with two shillings. That's about 50 cents in his pocket. And, but in answer to prayer and without making his needs known to human beings, he received the means necessary to erect the great buildings and feed the orphans day by day for 60 years. In all that time, the children did not have to go without a meal. And Mr. Muller said if they ever had to go without a meal, he would take it as evidence that the Lord did not want the word work to continue. Sometimes the meal time was almost at hand and they did not know where the food would come from, but the Lord always sent it in due time during the days that Mr. Mueller had charge of the homes. There's a couple of things to notice here. 
Muller and his wife Mary gave away freely all they had above their present need. They weren't buying mansions or Learjets. Also, Muller watched for signs from the Lord. As he said, if, there had ever gone, if they had ever had to go to without a meal, he would take it as evidence that the work should no longer go on. Another example is St. Francis of Assisi, who receiving his call, decided to live according to Jesus' instructions to the disciples when he sent them out two by two. His sole possessions were a robe, sandals, and a staff. He would go each day into town and work for his daily bread, never taking more than he needed for one day. Then he went back out of town and continued his work rebuilding an abandoned church. As others heard about him and came to join him, Francis established a rule that none who followed his example could own more than a robe, sandals, and a staff, nor could they receive payment for their labor beyond what they could eat that day. Many today credit the example of this simple man with the restoration of the reputation of a church that was corrupted by worldly wealth and power. Again, Francis took nothing more than the little he needed for shelter and sustenance and placed all else to the service of the Lord. I know we struggle here to keep the church open, but I firmly believe we're doing the Lord's work. He does provide us with enough to meet our needs, and he has pointed us to the work he wants us to do, the same work that Jesus taught his disciples to do, to pray for each other, to preach the gospel, to teach sound doctrine, and to heal the sick. Trust in the Lord, ask and receive. The Lord will provide. <laughs> Today's Healing Prayer Sunday. In a few minutes, you'll be invited to come forward to receive the blessing of the Lord, and our prayer team will be available to pray for those who need healing of body and soul. This is the work of the Lord. He works through us, his disciples, to accomplish the restoration of all things. He commands us also to love one another. As Jesus said, just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are, you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Now, may the peace of the Lord, which surpasses all human understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. <laughs>